Action. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Casey Sampson, and this is Coffee with Casey. The reason why we do these, this series is that it's extremely hectic throughout the month, but this gives us an opportunity to sit down, have a cup of coffee, go over some of the important issues in real estate, market conditions, tips for sellers, buyers, you know, how things are, well, you know, how to handle inspection reports. Uh, so today's topic is don't believe everything you hear or read. Um, there's a lot of disinformation out there. So I'm going to clean a little bit of this up. It's called myths versus reality. These are not, this is not reality. This is a myth and that's a myth. So we'll go over a lot of that. We'll go over the market conditions. We're going to, you know, we've had a lot of activity with home inspections and home inspection releases. And I'm going to tell you the best way to handle that and how to keep yourself out of trouble when you're doing that. Um, we'll also go into uh, knowing who your buyers are and, and a term called geofencing. So everybody understand what that is. That is a new term. That is something we use. That is something that's very effective. Um, and that's something that the realtor should start learning how to use and can benefit the sellers. Um, then we'll close up by just talking a little bit about improvements you can make to your house. There are small improvements. There are major improvements. Um, we'll talk about what those are, how they help, how you can get them done, how you can do major renovations and not pay. Good morning, Michelle. And not, <laughs> and not pay until you go to settlement. So uh, anyways, before we do any of that, you know, I was reading through uh, some of the material that um, uh, is getting sent out to our sellers. And I just have to stop and say, you know, I, I really think, and Danny said this, Danny Sampson said this about his staff at Sampson Properties, that he thinks he has just the perfect staff. And, and I got have to uh, echo that. So a team is made up. It's not Casey Sampson. It's not, it's, it's so many important parts. So, so I just want to acknowledge some of the things that our back office does that's so important to us and to sellers. I'm going to start with Julie, who's been with me for five years all those beautiful brochures, all those great comments, all the nice website. I was sitting on caseysampson.com today, this morning, and I was looking over, just hitting every button I could to kind of look it over. I am telling you, there is more information on caseysampson.com than any seller or buyer could ever hope, ever hope to want. You read that information, and you are 99% smarter than any other seller out there. And basically, that is due to um, Julie taking the information that I have and putting it in an orderly fashion on a great website. Uh, the blogs are there. The Coffee with Casey's are there. Um, you know, Julie just does such a great job. And she is, when we talk about this geofencing, you know, she's the one where I can tell Julie, hey, this house has been on the market for 644 days. I think we ought to target this particular set of buyers. Julie takes that information. She targets those buyers. She shoots the information out, and within 30 days, we have the house sold. And it's sold to the exact person that we geo-targeted. So, you know, this is, this is Julie, and this helps every seller. So when, some, when you put your house on and it sells right away, and we get a contract and all is good, Julie does a great job in doing that. Perfect example, we had one on on Chathams Ford, uh, Chathams Ford, $1.1 uh, $1 million house. We said these buyers are coming from this corridor, which is Reston, Tyson's, D.C. and Alexander. So that side of Vienna feeds from those buyers. So Julie targeted buyers in those four demographics. And sure enough, we sold in the first weekend to an Alexandria couple uh, coming into Vienna. <coughs> now we're on the other side of Vienna, which is the southwest side, towards the metro station in Nutley. Now you're dealing with more Arlington and D.C. buyers. So, you know, you have to know who your buyer is and you geo-target them. So, anyways, that is, that is Julie. And I've had her for four or five, six years. Um, absolutely the consummate professional. And so the sellers are lucky to have her. On top of that, I was looking at Billy. Let's talk about the same contract, Chatham's Ford. They had their contract. It's ratified. Now what? Now what happens? Well, Billy, our back office uh, assistant who handles everything after the contract is done, lays out so professionally what's about to happen. Inspections, seller information sheets, everything a seller needs to know moving forward. It is such a professional back office on that portion of the show that 
Literally, we take our hands off. I meet you here in my office. We sit in front of these signs. We sign our documents, and everybody's happy because Billy did such a great job, and our alt agents do such a great job getting you to that settlement table. So um, one of the best in the business. She's been at it for 15 years. Uh, so, so Billy is really that backbone to carrying it forward. And then, you know, recently we added Michelle, um, and Michelle is a, she's brilliant. Um, she puts together reports. So once a house is listed, then it's monitoring traffic and communicating with sellers. So, you know, I do a lot of withdrawal listings. And when a listing withdrawals, I ask the seller, what, what, what really went wrong? What happened? And, she, and they will usually tell me that the communications all broke down. So what Michelle does is she gathers all the reports, showing time reports, uh, Facebook uh, logs, Realtor.com, Zillow, all these reports, puts them in one and gets them out to the alt agent and the seller. So we have a time to analyze the reports. Now, we know that it takes seven showings a week in that week in order to get a contract. We just know that through all the, we sold 156 houses last year, so we're pretty locked in on how many showings it's going to take. So, so seven's our number. That's what we're trying to hit. We get 21. We know we should get about three contracts. So Michelle does an, just a, such a professional job on Mondays getting all the information from the open house, from the all the different websites, putting it in a report, getting it out to the alt agent and seller, copying me so we can all look at that. Then on Tuesday, we review everyone and decide if we need to take any proactive uh, measures on this house. So um, for our sales support staff and for seller support and communications, we have Michelle. So, so that team, Julie, before the listing and the launch, Michelle during the monitoring period, the alt agent who is constantly calling and updating and getting these other uh, um, information for the agents from the agents uh, and doing follow up, and then and then Billy towards the uh, the end once we have a contract. I really don't think you can have um, that kind of professional team. I mean, it's it's rare that something like this would come together. Now, to top all that off, uh, you look at the Sampson Properties team. And I'm going to acknowledge Donnie Sampson, who has basically joined the management staff here at Sampson, who does a great job of providing us information like that, what happens next after you get a contract. Um, we modified that. Donnie originally developed it. And he did such a great job. Come on in, Billy. He did such a great job in, uh, you can mic up and sit on in for a second. All I'm doing is talking about. Yeah, I don't have, uh, I don't have an hour, but I figured I'd come in and say what's up to the crowd. We'll just say. What's up? So, <clears throat> so all of those put together, and, and again, I want to acknowledge Donnie because their support is, is pretty incredible. I mean, we have sitting here is Leslie McCray, who's putting this on, um, who is a social media director here at Samson Properties. Um, you know, you don't have like things like this at some companies, and, and so it's a great support. But, but the whole key to this is saving sellers money. We put all these processes, uh, we can afford them because Samson Properties does not participate in commissions. So when we charge a seller, we don't have to charge them an extra point, point and a half because we don't split our commissions with Samson Properties like most companies. They have to charge five or six percent because the company's going to get their portion. Um, and so we, we don't do that. So that allows us to do a four and a half percent listing so the seller wins. They also win because they have all these goods and services that they can have. So, you know, on my football team, our thing, we try and preach humility and humility. But every once in a while, I just have to say, you know, you have pretty dynamic, great staff. And, and we really need to acknowledge them. So um, I'll bring in Billy. And I'm going to talk about the next thing, too. And that is um, when we talk about um, the staff, each property, each listing has an alt agent. So the one I've talked about before where we geo-targeted Alexandria, uh, priced it right, sold it in the first weekend, 1.1 million, even though it's you know next very close to the toll road. Um, um, the alt agent is the one that communicates with all these agents that are showing the house. So we get a contract in. And the contract comes in 50,000 less than list price. 
So Billy gets on the horn and he starts talking to all the other agents. Sure enough, he finds somebody that is interested in the property and you can fill them in on what happened on that one. Do you want to give all the numbers or? Well, no, anyway, you can't so, give the numbers. So, so yeah, I didn't know. If you but it's over list. Right, so yeah, so we, um, we went back and uh, I you know, put emails out, phone calls out to all of the agents that showed the property over the weekend, um, you know, letting everyone know that there was a contract in. Um, and if anyone was interested, you know, that it would be a multiple contract situation to get your highest and best offer in by Monday at 5 o'clock, which is our protocol. Um, the first contract came in under list, was trying to kind of lowball us. Um, you know, we said it was going to be multiple contracts. They upped their price. Um, another contract came in, which is over list. And uh, that was a direct um, re um, response to me, you know, just reaching out to all of the we, I think we had probably 15 showings, so um, you know, just reaching out to all of the different agents and letting everyone know that there is a contract in. If you are interested in, in writing, please, please let me know. Um, one of the agents, was his clients were, were really interested in the property. Uh, they didn't realize that it was going to move this quickly. So I was like, yeah, you get, your, uh, get your offer and get your contract in. Um, make sure that it's, you know, if you want the house, make sure that it's, you know, very, uh, a very good offer so that we ended up getting above list, um, ratified that yesterday. So here's, the, so here's the bottom line. The bottom line is, should that seller have priced it in correctly, it would have sat for 30 to 60 days. They would have ended up at $50,000 under list price. Right. By pricing it correctly, Billy was able to get competing offers that now has one go to list price and one go over list price. So the bottom line is, by the seller pricing it correctly, they made approximately $70,000. So when I'm a stickler on talking about pricing and pricing, and everybody's like, will you shut up about pricing? But the difference between a seller getting $70,000 and not getting $70,000 is pricing it correctly in the first place. And I know Casey has, has preached a lot over the last couple of months about um, in the coffee with Casey, but if a seller has leverage, you can, you can use that leverage to negotiate terms. So the price is, is great and all, but if you have awful terms the, um, with home inspection or contingencies on, on your buyers um, sell of their selling home. their home. Um, so, so whenever you have competing offers, like I had, another, um, I had another townhouse go under contract this weekend. It was list price. There was three offers in at list price. I went to the three agents. I said, listen, Make your terms better, you know. Give me your best and, and and highest offer, which includes price, but also terms. So instead of having a home inspection, now it's only a home inspection for informational purposes only. We squeeze an extra two 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 and a half percent out of it, and we get our seller better terms, better price, and whatever. Give me a dollar amount. Exactly. What's two and a half percent? What's two and a half percent? How big was the townhouse? Uh, two fifty. So. All right. So you got another. You know, five grand, five Adam, grand, six yeah. grand. Um, I don't know if people can use $5,000, but that's a lot of money. Yeah. And I can tell you one thing, that's $70,000 to the sellers out off of uh, Beulah Road, pretty dang important as well. Exactly. So that, that's, that's the difference between, you know, doing it right and doing it wrong. So let me, let me take that, that thought right into the don't believe everything you hear and, and, and read. So Billy comes to me and he says, why don't you do a TV commercial? And I'm never in my wildest dreams would I ever do a TV commercial. Um, you know, I look bad enough on Facebook, for God's sakes. I don't want to be on TV. So, so, you know, I start thinking about it. And then all of a sudden I see some ads from realtors on TV. And they sound something like this. If I don't sell your home, I'll buy your home. And that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I mean, that's just absurd that if I can't sell it, I'm going to buy it. Buy it for what? You have to buy it, then flip it, then the guarantee. So I've been in this business for 39 years. I've never, has it been that long? Jeez. 81, 36 years. 36 years. I heard some scary kids that were born in 2000 will be Shut 18 up. next year. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's well, pretty scary. I don't need that. I remember. I got underwear older than that. Yeah. All right, so. That is. So, so anyways, <laughs> so I started listening to these commercials. And it's like, if I don't sell your house, I want to rip my head off. It's like, I've never, A, ever seen that happen. B, I went to that agent, and I looked at their track record, 
and they had 75 houses this year withdrew. that withdrew unsold. Why didn't they buy them? I don't know. They were supposed to buy them, Casey. Well, if you didn't sell yeah. them, you'd buy them, right? If you didn't sell them, you'd buy oh, them. Right. So I watched that. That got me a little bit upset. Then I saw the other one. And the other one says, we have 5,000 buyers. Well, I mean, I'm pretty good. We do about $100, $120 million a year. I don't have 5,000 buyers. I, don't, I wouldn't even have 100 buyers. I wouldn't have 15 buyers. So what the heck are they talking about? I mean, that's ridiculous. So I went back. I'm a numbers guy. So I'm a numbers guy. I go back. How many deals have you done? How many did you sell yourself? So of all the deals they sold, 6% of them they sold through them sold themselves to this cache of buyers they have. So it's, um, uh, it's absurd that you would say that. So I looked at our records. 30% of all of our listings are sold by our agents. Now, is that because we're sitting on 3,000 buyers or 5,000 buyers? The answer to that is no. You price the home correctly. You get it on the market. You hold your open house. Open house. You have professionals at the open house. We'll train the agents on how to do open houses. And lo and behold, well, we just settled. That little uh, couple that you just saw with a picture on our Facebook um, that just settled. That's another one. We sold it ourselves. Good property, well-priced. Buyers come right to the listing agents. They give me a point, and I'll buy it, you know, and I'll, I'll just use you guys to go through it. So that helps our sellers. It doesn't give them a discount, but it helps our sellers because we have our lenders, our home inspectors, our settlement title company. So the whole thing is on home field turf, um, and no funny stuff happens. So, so, so that's, that's a good thing. So, so the two myths, one, I'll buy your house if I can't sell it, is absolutely ridiculous. And every time you hear the commercial, you just shake your head. The other one is I have 5,000 buyers. Nobody has 5,000 buyers. It's an absurd thing to say. So not sure why you would even, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm flabbergasted that anybody would make that statement. So, or that a seller would buy something like that. So anyways, so those are things you hear that are, are really crazy. Now, here's some other things you're going to hear. Your neighbors are your worst enemy when you have to know who your friends are and who your enemies are. So your neighbors are great for cocktails. Your neighbors are great to go out to dinner, and your kids can go to soccer games and all, but they are not to price your house. A neighbor has, in their best interest, to get the highest price they can in that neighborhood. So what happens is they, they wreck the neighborhood. They absolutely wreck the neighborhood. I'll give you a perfect example. Well, I can't. I'm not going to mention neighborhoods. But all the sellers are trying to get the prices up high. So uh, we priced a house, and I went in, and they said, all the neighbors say you priced this house too low. Did they really? Well, 12 times they had put houses on the market in that neighborhood, and 12 times they had withdrawn unsold. Unsold. So these are the people telling us what the price of the house should be. Now, we sold 100, 120 million. Our listings sell at 100.1% of their list price. They sell on an average of 17 days. We're professionals at pricing houses. So your neighbors will steer you wrong like that. And when they say you've priced your house too low, do not listen to them. Yes, they want their house to be $1.2 million. Yeah, they want their house to be more than it really is. But they are not professionals. They are emotionally attached to the neighborhood. They want, they're emotionally attached to the neighborhood. So, um, so that is not somebody you want to hear. So that's one group that is the enemy. The other enemy is the websites, okay? You have uh, algorithms done by House Canary, Realtor.com, Realtor Property Net, uh, Realtor Resource Network, Zillow, Trulia, um, and HomeSnap, okay? And Billy can talk to, to some of those. The difference is sometimes 10% between what Realtor.com will say and what Zillow will say. So when a seller listens to Zillow and says, well, my house is worth $775,000, it's not. Your house is worth $730,000, it's not worth $775,000. So, you know, these are algorithms. Right. And the reason why Billy is sitting here, the reason why I asked Billy to leave his chosen profession of mortgage banking and come to work with us is because Billy is a financial numbers guy. I'm a numbers guy. So... Billy is a pricing expert, and he's working with me, under me, to price these houses. So real quick, Billy, um, 
in, in looking at a Zillow? Well, the, you know, the main thing that we come across is when, it, when we go to a listing appointment, our client will say, well, Zillow says this, right? And Zillow is just an algorithm that doesn't take into effect your lot. Is it on the toll road or is it a premium? Power lines. Do you have power lines across the street or next to you or in, the backyard. in your backyard or not? So that they don't take into effect things like that. Do you have water on your property? Do you have woods? Do you back to a park? Um, are you on Electric Avenue? A huge, busy road. So Upgrades um, and conditions. Upgrades well. and conditions, correct. So uh, the, the algorithm that Zillow uses is basically, it probably looks at your tax. It looks at your, uh, your tax assessment, your square foot, which a lot of times is incorrect. Well, here's, here, here's where we know it's wrong. So let's, let's say I, I just went to a house and it was, Zillow said, um, and I'm using accurate numbers, 775. So the average home in the neighborhood sells at 110% of their assessed value. That is 125% of its assessed value. So my question is, what the hell are you looking at? And, you know, now... Zillow got sued because, you know, they're wrong so much, you know, and, and they were off so much. But they succeeded in the lawsuit because of First Amendment, free speech. They can say whatever they want. If that's what they say it's worth, that's what they, if that's what they think it's worth, that's what they think it's worth. So, this, they, you know, they got there by causing free speech. Now, don't get me wrong. Zillow is an excellent site. Zillow is a great site. Zillow is information. It gives buyers a lot of information that's very, very good. But when you go to pricing, yeah. you can't believe what you read on Zillow. Same way. Billy and I just had one. The Zillow estimate was $50,000 low. Right. So everybody had low. The, the average of all those sites I recommended, the average was below what we felt the house was worth. So now the problem now lies... The problem with the before, buyers. yeah, with the buyers. So, so if it's too high, the sellers think, well, you're lowballing us. We should get that 1.15 number as opposed to 1.1. Well, if it's too low, now the buyers are looking at the website and they're saying, so let's take the, uh, let's just say that it's priced at Box Mill 900. Let's say it's priced at 900 and we price it at 975. Well, now the buyers are thinking, well, it's supposed to be 900. Why is it 975? Right. Right. So. Right. So, so here's what you have to do. So in that case. If we're truly experts on pricing, and again, we work under this assumption. A seller doesn't want to get more than his house is worth, and a buyer doesn't want to pay less than a house is worth. So what we're trying to do is be experts on establishing value. What is the value? 975000 is 108% of the assessed value in this area, and if you look at all the comps, that's exactly where they're coming in, average of 1.8. So we're accurate there. The other one is um, we have um, a, a, another form is price per square foot. If all colonials built between 1985 and 95, between 2,400 square feet, 2,800 square feet sell for $282 a square foot, on average, $282 a square foot, $975,000. So we can come at it from a couple of different ways to prove our price and how we do it. Now, here's another way that we do it. And this is something you, I think, unique to our team and, and Billy and my pricing strategy. And that is a growth chart, OK? So I took a house. Let me give you an example. There's a couple that called me up and they want me to look at their pricing. The house is 1.76 million. Very, very difficult to price a house because there are very few of those out there for that price range. So here's what I did. I said, well, give me all the houses in a million dollar price range or whatever. Let's go back to 2001 when they bought their house. How much have these homes grown, appreciated, appreciated since 2001? And we do that by taking uh, 150 houses that sold, and here's 2001 sales, here's the average 2002, three, four, five, and you can see the chart moving with the market. So since 2001, the market in, around there has gone up a, a, a 40%. So if you take what they bought the house for, 2001, and you apply 40% to that, you're going to get somewhere around $1.6 million. They originally went on the market at $2.35 million. They're now down to about $1.79 million. Looks like it should be somewhere in the one sixes. So, so you can look at assessments. You can look at price per square foot. And when all else fails, sometimes you have to go back and do a growth chart. So you come at it from all these different directions. And, and you know, sometimes we look at it and, and we'll say, OK, um, this house has extraordinary upgrades 
that you put in two hundred thousand dollars. Your your dad and I did one where the guy spent two hundred fifty thousand dollars on a pool and the whole right. system. Well, out in Haymarket, I think. Right, and Haymarket. So you have to. You can't give them two hundred fifty thousand dollars onto the price of a base. So every house is a box. Consider your box. It's only so big. So we have the box. The box is worth X amount of dollars. That backyard is the extraordinary upgrade. What's that worth? Well, it's two hundred fifty thousand dollars. You can't have. You're not going to get two fifty. But are you going to get a hundred? Are you going to get one hundred twenty-five? Are you only going to get seventy-five? Depends on how valuable that is to the buying public. Now, the house we just sold on Chatham's, Chatham's Ford had this cool pub in the basement, had a really nice pool in the backyard. Nice patio. And a great patio. So these are the extraordinary issues. On top of that, we have a, a house that's on uh, Dulles Toll Road, close, which is going to affect value. So we have a negative of, of a toll road. We have a positive of a pub and a positive of the, the thing. So balancing these things out, that is what real estate professionals do, or really good ones do, um, what we do, um, as opposed to trying to price a million houses across the country and think you're going to have some accuracy. So, do you so want to do you want to touch on the buying pool real quick? So, Chatham's Ford has a <coughs> pool in the backyard. Right. So that eliminates a lot of young families. Right. But this pool was actually set up off of the patio and was fenced off on its on its own. So you can have a patio with your with your little kids and keep them away from the pool because it was fenced by itself, so which the, opens up the buyer pool right. to, to a lot of the younger moms with younger kids that are scared of a pool. So is a pool good or bad? Are you going to make money or not make money? It really depends. If your house is set up in the elementary school district where the elementary moms want to be, but you have a pool that's exposed and not fenced in, now it's a negative because you just wiped out, as Billy says, Nine out of 10 families, which are those one, two, three kids, young, under 12 years old, those are our, that's our target market. Normally, we're looking when we see a pool, give me kids that are 12 years old and above. So instead of looking at 30-somethings, we're looking for 40-somethings, which is our geofencing. Well, this, you're right. It was way off on the side. It was fenced in, had a big gate, beautiful, beautiful fencing. So now, great elementary school, great high school, um, it's off by the side, so now it opens the buyer pool back up to young Younger. and old. Right. So it did expand the buyer pool, and you have to be able to point that out because a mother who may be concerned may say, you know, the way it sits, it's not really a concern for the younger family, so it's much more saleable than if we didn't have this fence and kids could wander out of the basement and walk in the pool, and before you know it, they're, you know, moms will envision them going face down. So. So uh, not so in a case <coughs> like that. So, so again, this is all a function of, of knowing your market. So let's get back to um, you know, other people that are enemies, enemies, or what I call the wolves. OK, so um, sellers are the sheep. They don't do this but once every 20 years. And all of their money, all their life savings is dependent on this. Um, we're the sheepdog, or I think German Shepherd more than sheepdog. But, and then there are the wolves, and the wolves are Zillow. The wolves are agents, agents that are, will promise you the agents, world. Yep. There are other agents, too. And the other agents um, are agents that will come in and tell you your house is worth more than it is. And this is, this is I've got some great articles on this. They're called Hungry Agents. Buying listings. Right. So I go to a couple, 1.4 million. That's what your house is worth. It's just worth 1.4 million. A wife wanted one five or plus. An agent walks in, big name agent, and says, "Hey, this house is worth 1.575 million dollars." So they put it on the market. It took 200 days to sell that house. They got 1.4 million dollars. So what I tell people is, you know, you can go through that if you want, or we can save you the, you know, perfect example. I tell them is I rotator cuff. Yeah. <laughs> I fell down three months ago. I ripped my rotator cuff. I knew it was ripped, but I was hoping it would get better. So I've lived through three months of hell, can't sleep. You know, every time I touch it, I, it drives me crazy. I've lost 50 yards off my drive. That's why I'm driving yeah, so. Yeah, right. That's <laughs> why I'm not driving as well. So, uh, that's so anyway, so now I'm going in and getting it fixed. Well, had I got it fixed originally, it would all be over. I never would have gone through any of the pain. I'd be, I'd be doing somersaults again. Um, and, uh, so, you know, 
don't waste that time. Don't waste that six months. So the wolves are agents that will overprice your house. Um, agents say they'll buy it. That's ridiculous. Agents say they'll sell it with their own buyers. That's incorrect. Um, Zillow ads telling you your house is more than they are and neighbors that are telling you your house is worth than they are. You have to have an agent that you trust that knows what they're doing, whether it's us or whether it's somebody else. You need to put your trust in them. I will tell you this, that 10% of our listings withdraw and sold. And I can tell you the common denominator in every one of them. The sellers think they're smarter than we are. So when a buyer list or a seller listens and they follow the protocol and the pricing protocol and work their way through the system, they get rewarded. Um, these, this couple that we just put on got a $70,000 bonus for listening. Um, and then we have other sellers that just won't listen, want to modify contracts, want to overprice, want to wait, want to stall, want to see if they can squeeze more money out of buyers. And every time they do, you'll lose the buyer, lose the deal, withdraw, and, and, and then go through more hell. So, so really, I, 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 um, and, and if you're not in this area or you're going out of the area, you're moving to another area, you have family in other areas, we would be happy to track down an agent that knows what the heck they're doing. We interview agents all the time. When our, when our sellers have people out of town that are trying to sell a house or they're going to buy a house, we'll interview them, we'll ask them the questions, we'll find a Casey Sampson team in that area, somebody that knows what they're doing, um, and then we'll refer you to that agent. So, um, because you may not know the questions to ask. Right. Um, around here, there are agents that have <coughs> 75 houses on the market and two under contract. So what's the first question I'm going to ask them? How many listings you got? How many are under contract? What's your percentage under contract? And I want to see your sales report. And I want to see, you know, when you price your house, what percentage does that sell of the list price? What's your average days on market? Um, you know, what's your current inventory? Give me an update on your market. How do you, give me, send me the market. reports you send your sellers. So, you know, throwing a house on the market is one thing, but man, let me tell you something. If you're not tracking that thing and you're not making adjustments as we go, you are in big trouble. So uh, anyways, those are the wolves. So. The theory of this show was don't believe everything you hear, don't believe everything you read, and those are the examples of how the wolves get you and could mislead you into doing bad things, okay? All right, so um, let's talk about the current conditions, and, and I think that um, uh, this is big news. This is really, really good news. Uh, we did not have a good August, and September was a little slow. Um, uh, October is booming. Um, we have got seven houses sold in the last 10 days, and I believe we've probably had two contracts or three contracts on each one. So as long as we're pricing it correctly, the buyers are coming, they are getting under contract, we are getting through the home inspection process, which we'll talk about in a showings minute. Showings are up. Showings are up. Um, yeah, showings are definitely up. So uh, Michelle, bless her heart, does, a, uh, does our, our showing report. report. And we can see how all of our listings are being shown. And it went from a lot of them being in the red, which is under three showings a week, to everybody being in green, which is getting enough showings to generate contracts and most of them getting under contract. So that, that is certainly good news. And for those of you that are thinking about putting your house on the market now, it is the time to go because our inventory is low. As long as we don't get carried away with the pricing, as long as we're in good condition, and we'll talk about how to get your house in good condition, um, we are good to go. So market is, a, market is a go. If some of you are thinking about selling in January or February or March, get a photographer. If you're thinking about listing, we should talk about it now. We'll get our, our photographers out there. They'll get pictures of the exterior of the house now while you've got, leaves. you know, before our first frost, before the leaves have changed. Let's, let's get the green trees out. Let's get the bushes out there. Uh, let's get the landscaping looking good. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, you want to get your pictures for that as soon as you possibly can. Um, we just talked about, um, um, you know, all these houses going under contract. And I think it's a good time now to talk about uh, home inspections, which is the number one cause of contracts falling apart. Now, all of us went through pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, the home inspections went through pretty quickly. And, and let me give you a, a, a change in, uh, in strategy for something like this. Most people, when they do a home inspection, will 
um, say, well, I'll tell you what, we'll give you $3,000, or we'll give you $4,000, or we'll give you $5,000, or we'll give you $1,500. We'll give you a number which will get rid of this contingency. Well, we don't believe in that. We really don't. And, and I'm going to tell you why. Because when you tell a person, hey, um, this is not, well, you know, we'll give you $500 for this, this thing. What's the first thing they're going to do? They're going to want their contractor to come out and give his estimate on what that's worth. Well, I don't know how many contract estimates you guys get, but contractors can go out there and say, well, you know what? Not only is this broken, but that's broken, that's broken, that's broken. This whole thing is going to cost $4,000. Why? They want to get paid. Get paid right? So what you're doing is you're inviting buyer contractors into your house <clears throat> to look at what a home inspector found and expand on that to a point of, well, this beam is wrong and that beam is wrong. And before you know it, it can get very, very out of hand. So, so the way you want to handle this is very simple. Electrical issues, plumbing issues, HVAC issues, wear and tear issues. If it's a wear and tear issue, we have nothing to talk about. The price reflects the age of the, of the systems and the age of the home. Not, not, not up for discussion. There are other items, and Billy's seen these, where there are improvements. Well, I recommend that you put this on. Well, that's just an improvement. We're, we're not paying for your improvement. So you throw out the improvements. You throw out the wear and tear items. You get down to electrical, heating, cooling, plumbing, you know, real issues where you need a contractor to fix. And you negotiate those down and say, we'll fix these items, we won't fix those items. Now, a seller may say, well, now i got to do a lot. No, you don't have to do anything. You give a list to our contractor, to our plumber, plumber. list to the electrician, a list to the HVAC, HVAC. guy. Um, contractors that work for top producing realtors uh, are very tight with their budgets. They know what we want. They get a lot of business from us, so they're not going to. They're trying to figure out how to save us money and give our sellers uh, a, a paid in full receipt that this has been inspected and fixed. Right. So you can either have your contractors do it for as, as least expensive as possible, or you can have their contractors come in and give a huge estimate. Before you know it, now you're spending, instead of that $1,500 to fix it, now you're talking about, well, actually, you're talking about three, five, seven, ten thousand dollars $10,000, or they may scare the heck out of the buyers and the buyers walk. So this is not something to mess with. This is, this is not something to do with the easy way and say, the easy way is to say, I'll fix these items, electric, heating, pl plumbing, HVAC. I'll give them my contractor. I'll get them done. Um, and I'm not doing the wear and tear. And for God's sakes, the garage door is fine. Um, a lot of them will say it doesn't bounce off, and that's a hazard. You, you know, they talk about having their kids trapped under the garage door, not going to happen. So anyways, um, uh, you know, these are all issues in this home inspection. It's, it's, it's not a little thing. It's a massive thing. It's a big nightmare. So again, if the sellers listen, right. do it the way we say that we do it on all of them, then we're gonna, everything's going to be just fine. And it goes back to pricing. If you have the leverage, if there's multiple contracts behind, Right. right, right. We go to the agent. And we say, "Hey, man, we're going to fix you know these five or, or, or eight items. We're not going to fix the thirty-two items you want, right? Because backup contract one or backup contract two will accept those eight to ten items, right? So it's all about who has leverage. If, if your seller has leverage, and we just sold it above list price in the first weekend with multiple contracts, now we're in a leverage situation. If it's two hundred and seventy days, and there's one buyer." Hell yeah, you're going you're to do all 32 <laughs> things because we don't want to lose that, that one buyer right. after 280 days. Well, so. that's a perfect example. So let's go back to the $1.4 million house. Right. The $1.4 million house goes in. And the reason why we say 1.4 is because the, every time you go over $100,000, you lose half the market. Threshold. So the thresholds are if there's 20 purchases under 1.4, there's only 10 after 1.4, there's only five after 1.5. So you literally, the market goes down for every $100,000 you increase. So if we get a big pool of 1.3 plus million dollar buyers, anything under 1.4, they're fighting for it. They end up paying 1.425 or 1.44 with backup contracts. Right. Then the inspection comes in and we tell them to pound sand. We'll fix this, this, and this, everything else, forget about it. We have over list price. We've done it in the first two weeks. 
We save you eight months worth of trouble, you've got more money, and you have leverage during the home inspection process. Again, the wolves got them. Now, we feel bad. I'll be honest with you, I blame myself that that seller's going to lose you know, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars, and do I blame myself? Yes, I did not protect them from the wolf. The wolf won. The agent that said I can get you one point five seven five, they won. They get a lot of homes withdrawn. They get, you know, one one agent that, that we compete against. Just just for example, this is how this is how prevalent this is. One a the closest agent to <coughs> us on volume in the Vienna Oakton area. Um, we were at. I don't know, 53 million, they were at 35 million. But they had $29 million worth of listings that withdrew unsold. Well, you know, when you withdraw a listing, that means that you failed, you've been on the market for six months, you, you're just worn out. It's an emotional nightmare. Um, so, you know, when I lose a client to an agent that tells them they can get more for the house, I feel bad because I know where they're headed. I've seen the movie, I know how it ends, and it's not pretty. So, so I, 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 you know, I feel bad about it. I think I failed the, the seller, even though they've selected somebody else. Uh, you know, we kind of failed to protect them against that agent that's willing to promise them more money. So that's, uh, you know, it is what it is. These things happen in real estate. So hopefully if you're spending some time to listen to Coffee with Casey, you don't make the same mistake. So. I know this is boring stuff, but it could save you fifty to seventy thousand bucks. That is on top of nine months of sanity, too. On top of, they paid six percent for that listing. Right. So it's a point and a half extra that they paid. So whatever a point and a half, fourteen. That's twenty thousand dollars. So they spent twenty thousand dollars more on commissions. They spent six months on the market. They lost about forty to fifty thousand dollars. And it's all because I couldn't convince them that the price was what the price was. Um, and they went with an agent that told them it was worth more. So anyways, my bad. Sorry. All right. Last thing I want to talk about today, OK? We talked about pictures, getting them ready. Let's talk about um, getting your house ready for, um, for sale. So there's minor things you can do, and there's major things you can do. Um, it's our job, and, and again, this is, uh, you know, if our topic of today is don't believe everything you hear and read, um, you know, how does Zillow know whether your house is painted in orange or, um, you know, gray. mindful gray? Uh, how do they know what your appliances are? How do they know what the flooring is? You know, some people have done, some people have said, well, these are all new floors. I'm like, yeah, you got to rip those out. Those are really bad. Those are not customary for a house of this price range. So you have to look at when you're improving a house. In other words, do you use, can you use a, um, um, a GE profile refrigerator in a house that's over 1.25 million? The answer is no, you can't. You got to go to Gen Air, you got to go to KitchenAid, you have to go to another level of appliances. If you're going to go to 1.5, certainly you better have Wolf or you better have Viking or you better have a big name uh, in there. The flooring. Um, you could put in uh, a flooring that is, that is uh, you know, just not attractive or you could put in a hand-stained four-inch oak floor and have it stained on site and then it's pow, then it looks great. So, so let's just talk about some small improvements. Every person really should consider um, painting their house, at least a portion of the house, at least when you walk in to show this is, you know, your, your sellers and we are 50, 60, 70,000, uh, 70 years old. That's, that's my typical seller, 50, 60, 70. Kids are out of college, they want to move up, down, or, or someplace, they want to go to South Carolina or retire. It looks great to you. But that color doesn't cut it, and the window treatments don't cut it, because who you're trying to sell to is a 35-year-old woman, and she doesn't want to live in her mom's house. And right now, it looks great for mom and dad, but it doesn't look good for the kids that are coming in. This is why a lot of my alt agents are 30-somethings, like Kelly, Colby, um, um, Pam, <laughs> Billy, um, yeah, Shana. So, so I'll walk into a house and I'll say, looks good to me. 
And Kelly will say, absolutely not. We are not. They gotta, they've got to change this. They've got to change that. I would never move into that house with this or with that. So sometimes it may look good to me, but you'll always see an alt agents there. You know, those are, that's the buying public. That's, these are the keen eyes. So, uh, um, you know, the, the paint is, is a lot of times can, can take a house from 1985 to 2017. Carpeting, flooring. Flooring is important. So paint and flooring is very, very important. The other thing that's important that people don't think about is the houses that were built between 1990 and 2005 have brass handles, doorknobs, gold, gold or gold, you know, and it and it just looks awful. Uh, not, not, not I don't awful. say it looks awful. It looks normal. Day you won't mind. notice it. You don't even notice. It. Some of you may not even know you have gold handles on your thing. But for $2,000, you have a handyman come in, they swap out everything with brushed nickel. Now, when you look at all the handles and all the doorknobs having brushed nickel and all the hinges with brushed nickel, it changes the, the, the dynamic of that house because the home that they've been living in, the apartment that they rented that was built in 2012, it's all brushed nickel. Every house they're looking at, all the new houses, brushed nickel. They can't afford them, but that's what they want. When they go into a gold house, they think mom and dad's house, they think 19, older. yeah, older home. So it's very easy, uh, very cost effective to swap out and go to brush nickel or at least a, uh, a doorknob that they will see in some of today's houses. So, so the paint carpet and doorknobs, that's an easy fix. Some people say, look, I don't want to do anything. And that's fine. You're tired. You're not, forget it. I'm not doing anything. That's okay. But I would say that if you did do that, you're probably looking at getting five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times the money that you just spent um, back, okay? Um, let's talk about major. How much time we got? Where are we at? Is everybody asleep yet? Wake. 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Get another cup of coffee. Um, let's talk about some major stuff. And again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, we have a contractor, you know, who's, who's great, and what he'll do is I had a house and um, I didn't know how I was going to sell it. I'm like, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I mean, it, it was a 1972 kitchen, and the bathrooms were 1972, and it was all, you know, families that have all boys. I grew up in a family of all boys. Houses are treated a little different, you know, like our playground, and um, they don't wear well. Let's just put it that way. So, um, so we had a problem. And I also had sellers. They did not have the money to make the renovations. They did not know, you know, basically what we were going to do. So we brought in our contractor. He put in the new kitchen, new bathrooms, uh, updated the floors, painted the house. And before you know it, not only did we sell it in the first weekend, we sold it $15,000, $20,000 more than even we thought we could get when it was renovated. So my guess is they spent $80,000 and the house sold and $140,000 more than we would have got had I had to put that house on the market. Also, you put a house on the market. You really want everybody, because a lot of neighbors are coming through. Do we really want all the neighbors coming through the house um, in this condition? So, so the alternative is we call in somebody, say, let's just renovate it. I mean, um, I'm 59 years old. A lot of my friends are... Um, their parents are 80, 85 years old. So, you know, we have to make that decision. What are we going to do with the house? The, the parents have died. Now what are we going to do? Sometimes it's knock it down and sell it to a builder, sell the lot. Other times it's let's bring in, you know, our contractor and let's get this done. So let me give you an example. We had a lot and it was 575 is what the builder was willing to pay for it. And really no family was going to move into the house in its current condition. So we bring in Sam. He puts in $100,000 into the property. We sell for $765 in the first weekend. So they put in $100,000. They got you know, $190,000, $195,000. So, so they really made a $95,000 profit. It sold in that first weekend. We had multiple buyers. There were no home inspection items. Anyway, there were. Sam took care of, and it was a wham, bam, thank you. It was very nice. So, And the $100,000, so, Sam... Did we'll not wait until yeah. closing, which yeah. is good for our, our contractor. 
So the con so the, come out of pocket. the sellers basically put nothing out of pocket. They just said, okay. So that's one way to do it. Um, another way is um, you know, to sell as is, the house as is. Now, when you do that, um, I, I also had another one of my football players come in, and they had a, their father's house to sell. Um, are they going to put the money in and fix it up? The answer is no, because I didn't see an out. I didn't see a, an exit strategy for them. Even if they were to put in seventy-five to $80,000 in the house, I just didn't see the exit strategy. I think there needed to be more done to the house than just that. So that was sold to a contractor that's going to buy for three fifty, dollars put in one hundred and twenty-five, dollars and then you know, flip it and do whatever he's got to do. So that's one where you sell the house that's going to be renovated to a contractor, uh, get some contractors to bid on it, take your best, highest, and best offer, and then away you go. So, so that's an all-cash deal that happens in two to three weeks. Um, so, so, you know, you have to come in and say, well, what's the house? Is it worth more alive? Is it worth more dead? Is it worth more, you know, totally renovated? Or do we just sell it as is? So you kind of have to make those decisions when that time comes, okay? Um, let me see if there's anything really on my list here that I really wanted to talk about um, today. But, you know, that's basically um, sums up your... First of all, I just want to say, really, how much I appreciate the staff, as I mentioned before, Julie and Billy and Michelle. And then I, I really have the greatest salt agents of all time. B Billy's a financial you know, genius guru. Um, Kelly has the, the just great taste. Kelly sold more houses at open houses than any person you'll ever meet. Um, she is really just wonderful to work with. Um, Shana and Pam, mother and daughter team. Uh, Pam's been in the business for... Um, 15 years doing this with Bernie Kagan, and Shana is just beautiful and wonderful, and, and it has that 35, you know, 30-something taste where uh, just, just so professional. She's been in the industry now for five years as a back office, and now she's out working on the houses. And of course, Colby is uh, the master of how you would put a house back together again. Um, he's done it many times, uh, very professional. So, so really, we you know, we're lucky enough to have just Don't a... forget Pat. My brother, Pat. So, Patrick, you know, everybody's got to have that steady hand in the back where if anything goes wrong, he knows how to handle it. So, Pat, Pat is also an alt agent. He works with a lot of my sellers. When I work with Pat, it's easy to go like this, say, you got it, and they're in great hands. Um, Pat's been with me now for, for a long, well, 30 years. Pretty long. Um, yeah. He just, he's just a Mr. Everything uh, to me, but he's kind of the father of the whole group. So, um, you know, it, it's just a nice setup for everybody, and especially the, um, especially the sellers. But um, we are going to do a pricing seminar, and this is going to get in-depth on pricing houses. This is going to work on how to use the, um, the pricing models online, the, um, all the Zestimates and Estimates and how to, how to do that how to calculate what your box is worth, how to go up and down with all the upgrades and pricing and lot premiums like Billy's talking about. Um, it's gonna, I'm going to demonstrate how you use a growth chart um, you know, to get this done. I also want to deal with the communication and reporting you need with a seller because I don't, you know, it's all about setting expectations and, and, and for you sellers, here's, here's why houses go for 180. Let me tell you why they go for 180 <coughs> days. I can get you 1.57, I can get you 1.575. Go with me, that's what it's worth. Guess what? Not there. So they're reticent to drop the price because you said it's worth 1.575. You told me it was worth that. So they're reticent to come back and say, hey, look, I made a mistake. It really is only worth this, or it's only worth that, or you're dropping the price, or we're dropping it down again. So you know, they get listings by promising high prices, and then they have to backtrack on that. So it's harder for them to do it. We do the exact opposite. We tell them that this is how we arrived at our pricing. This is where we think it is, and this is why we think it's there. If you, if you want to go above it. That's your business. But we're going to track and see if you generate the, if, if that number generates the traffic. If it doesn't generate the traffic, we know what to do next. Quickly get back. So we're estimating. So here's, a, here's the way ours sounds. All right, your house is worth a million fifty. We think 
that because of the road, wherever it is, the sticks and bricks, it's worth a million one. Because of the road, I think it's worth a million fifty. Then we start adding on the pool and the pub and the other upgrades, and we arrive at a number that's $1.1 million. And that's because we're estimating that at 50 and estimating this at 100, so we think we can get 1.1 million. That's what we think. So let's say we go along, let's say we were wrong and we didn't get the pushback. Well, maybe that road is $100,000, and maybe the pool and pub aren't giving us what we need. But clearly, if we're not getting this traffic, we've set expectations that if we're not getting the traffic, we're not gonna sit around and wait because all statistics show, like I said in my ad, that if you sell your house in the first 30 days, you're gonna get this. If you have to go to 60 days, it's gonna be this. And this is price per square foot. If you're gonna go to 90 days, it goes down here. So the longer your house sits on the market, the less money you're gonna get per square foot. So that is because a house gets stale. So we don't want the house to get stale. Set expectations. This is what we're thinking. We're going to give you information. You make the decision. This is where we think it is. And if we're wrong, we're going to know about it because we're just not going to get the traffic. Okay? And we have other houses that are, you know, 1-3, but they're in a neighborhood that doesn't support 1-3. So we have to be cognizant of that. We're not getting the traffic. We need to move. We need to move. So. You know, we may list a lot of houses, 70% of them may sell quickly, 30% of them, we've got to be cognizant, we've got to, you know, do the traffic, reanalyze, 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 reprice at 30 days, analyze, 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 reprice. So, so uh, when the couple came to me and said our house has been on since March, it's like, how does that happen? How, how do people just leave a house on the market uh, for that long? So, you know, you need to be certainly proactive after you list the price. And, and monitor that traffic because today's buyers, these 30-somethings, even the 40-somethings, very smart. They, they see what's coming on. They see it immediately. It's instant, instantaneous. Goes in, goes out, ads are in. They look at it. They can see movies on it. They see everything they need to see. They see tax records, bat sales. Did you list it? How long has it been lower? They see all this information, and they move. So consider this to be like fishing. So you're baiting the water. Fish come up. If the bait is either the wrong bait or it's out of the water, they'll come, they'll look, they'll swim off. They're not coming back. It's very difficult. Once those, once those fish in the first two weeks swim away, hard to get them back. So you really want to make sure that that first 30 days, that first 30 days, I keep emphasizing it as much as I can, the first 30 days we're going to get the max amount of money, so we need to be very thoughtful on how we prepare it, market it, track it, and finish it, okay? So that's, that's kind of the way the system works, okay? Did you have anything, Billy, that you're? Now, the only thing that I would piggyback on that is whenever you readjust, whenever you adjust down, mm -hmm. you're now a 30-day-old listing. You're not a brand-new listing, so you have to catch your tail, is what we like to call it. Um, you know, if you, you don't if want to chase at a million, your tail. If you're at a million one and you're dropping to a million fifty, because we said it was a million fifty, it's not a million fifty anymore. It's a million twenty-five or a million. Right. So you got to get back down underneath that. That's right. something that I would say to that. <coughs> so that's why when we drop at a certain group, you don't drop ten thousand. You drop twenty-five thousand. When you get to a certain level, you drop fifty thousand. And then when you get to another group, you drop it by a hundred thousand. So, so depending on the price of that house, depending on the thresholds that it goes down. Um, you know, Billy mentioned the word thresholds, and thresholds are important because if everybody's going to find your, your property on a, web, on a website, well, those websites are set up to say, give me everything from 750 to 850. So they're not, give me everything from 750 to 860, it's 850. Right. So why would you put something on for 860. 860? So, and again, I can only give people advice. Person wants to go on for 860, that's fine. No traffic, no traffic, no traffic. Get it to 850 at least and get it under that threshold where we really should have been in the first place because those two weeks worth of fish never saw it. Right. They came up, it was out of the water, it wasn't in the water, so they looked at the bait, couldn't get it, and swam away. So this is, this is not a good strategy. The good strategy is... Listen, listen to what I've done. <laughs> I do this every day, <coughs> you know. How many houses? We had 100, 100, I don't know, 
I don't know, hundreds, hundreds of houses go. So I do it every day. I see patterns. I see, we see it happen. It's like, listen to me. Listen to my staff. They'll tell you what you're doing. Finished on time. Do we finish on time? Is it 10.30? It's a wrap. No, no, no. Look, so <laughs> in closing, um, this is the Casey Sampson team. I've mentioned all my staff members today. If you're thinking about listing your house, we'd be happy to work with you on that. If you're a realtor and you don't think you can handle a listing or you think that it may be out of your market or we would be better off to handle it, we team up with realtors. We do referral fees all the time. In fact, a lot of realtors, when they're selling their house, will call us in to list their house for them. So we do do referral fees. Some agents can work with us on the listing. Some just hand it off and, and go other ways. Um, so by all means, if you uh, need any help, please, uh, please let us know. Um, for the realtors, we will have a pricing seminar next Wednesday. And I think it's, it's here, right? It's, it's here. It's at 10 o'clock. Um, we're going to go from 10 to 12. Um, you know, if I still have a voice left, we may do a workshop. We'll let everybody else leave, and then we'll do a workshop on how to actually do a growth chart. And, and somebody, I'll say, somebody give me a house, and, and Billy and I will price it on the spot. And we'll, you know, we'll go like this in the beginning, and we'll, from soup to nuts, uh, hit the track, hit the tax record, hit our search, pull out our, our comps, um, pull out our apples to apples, um, do, do, you know, we'll, we'll compare it, we'll do our growth charts, and when we're all done, and then we'll look at, we'll compare all of the estimates and estimates and all the rest of that garbage, we'll look at it all, and when it's done, we as a group are going to know that that box is worth X amount of dollars. Now, when we go in, is the box superior, inferior, or customary? So, we'll adjust that box up and down, and we'll talk about that. So, uh... So yeah, we'll actually do one on site. That will not be online. So the 10 to 12 will be online and people can look at it. The workshop from 12 to 1 where we actually start doing that, we'll turn the cameras off and anybody here uh, will get that done And uh, because that is not something I want to, you know, I'm willing to share online. That's just something where we're, we're going to go ahead and show you exactly how we'll do it. We'll show you how we track them in our folders, what documents go in there, how we do it, how we do our listing presentation, and bam, it's going to be done. So uh, um, that will be from 12 to 1. So bring a sandwich, because here's one thing I don't do. I don't buy donuts, right? <laughs> like, when I worked and went and talked to agents, you know, well, aren't you going to bring us some donuts? It's like, I don't buy donuts. I'm going to bring, bring information, and that's what I have. So somebody pack me a sandwich, yeah, for exactly. God's sakes, all right? I need a sandwich, so somebody bring me a sandwich, an orange crush, and I'm just going to keep on going right on through. I'll work through. All right? And if not, we'll go to, we'll go to Anita's afterwards. All right? <laughs> if I still have any energy. I want to thank you for spending time with me this morning. Uh, coffee with Casey. I want, and uh, Billy Sampson joined me here. Uh, Leslie McRae did a great job, as, as always, setting this up for us. Uh, I want to thank my staff for all they've done. Um, and we'll see you next month on uh, Coffee with Casey. Thanks. Bye-bye.